All right. Welcome, everyone. This is Katie at Musicians Estonian Injury Live Talk. Um, thank you for everyone who's joined. Um, I have Steve. And Steve, I forgot to ask you how to pronounce your last name because I'm not sure if it's a Rosé or Ro Ro Rosé? Rosé. Rosé. That's it. Rase. And uh, for many of you know that he's the principal tuba of the Sydney uh, Symphony, and I'm just so glad to have him here tonight. Um, we're going to be talking about the topic of performance mindset, um, especially anxiety here. Uh, so Steve, welcome. I'm so happy to have you here, and thank you for taking your time on your day to do this with me. Oh, thank you, Katie, uh, for having me. And for everybody out there, greetings from Saturday morning in Sydney, Australia. Yes, I forgot. We're like an 18 hour time difference. It's really huge. It's like a whole day and a half or something. That's right. <laughs> um, well, Steve, um, while I'm going and checking and making sure that um, everything is live and I'm sharing our live stream, I'm going to go ahead and ask you to introduce yourself, even though we did put your bio in the section. Um, All right. Could you tell us a little bit about like what got you into music in the first place? Just uh, just so some people have a little idea of your background, like how I got you into tuba playing, you're, you became a professional musician. And then, of course, um, you went into uh, uh, neuro linguistic programming. Mm -hmm. Great, great, Katie. Well, I'm from California originally, so uh, just uh, a line directly south from where you are there in Seattle. I grew up in San Diego, started playing tuba at the end of junior high school. At the same time, I learned the unicycle. So these were my two great life revelations <laughs> at age 15. Then I went on to study at Arizona State with Daniel Parentoni, uh, went to Jacobs for a summer. And this is where I was introduced to a lot of NLP type teaching that uh, a lot of our listeners out there would appreciate. Things like, um, that you would read in the inner game of music, Timothy Galloway's, the inner game of tennis, modeling, hear a great sound, imitate that, don't think about what's going on. Um, then when I started studying neurolinguistic programming later on, I thought, oh, I've had an introduction to this already by my great tuba teachers. Um, then I did a series of auditions in my senior year of university and a couple years after that, about 20, I think I won three oh, or wow. four and the rest were feedback I learned and I've worked in Europe with both the Concerto Bar Orchestra and uh, Torino Radio Symphony Orchestra and it was in the New Mexico Symphony for a little while at the beginning and I've been with the Sydney Symphony Orchestra now for over 31 years as the principal tuba player I still have not picked up the Australian accent although you might hear <laughs> You might you might hear me saying hile instead of hail or tiles every now and then, but I've still got my California accent. And with mindset, um, one of the things that I've been doing quite a bit of over the last 15 years is teaching globally. I was for five years the assistant professor in Zurich with Aniela Fisser at ZH Deca. Oh wow. Been running Tuba Mania festivals throughout Asia. And what I found was as I progressed in my teaching career that if the student's mind is not in the right place, it's going to be hard for them to develop. Then I uh, was known as sort of like the mindset coach slash tuba teacher. And then I decided to take the opportunity to study mindset coaching formally, uh, which began with the um, Life Coaching Academy and getting a certificate for in life coaching. And part of that was studying neurolinguistic programming. And then when I learned that, I thought, why is there such a lack or why is there non existence of formal NLP coaching for musicians? Because it's widely, widely used in the athletic world. So if any of you were to right now Google uh, NLP and sports, you'll get a lot, you know, Olympic athletes. Uh, professional teams um, to to prepare the mind for competition when you're waiting and that gun's going to go pew, and you do your race, whatever happens in your mind is going to set you up for the results you get in that race. And it's no different to when we go on stage. And our mind will basically be in control of our results in an indirect way. So the way it works with NLP mindset is 
the way we talk to ourselves in our head talk will then create our behavior in our language. It'll even uh, affect things like blood pressure. And this is without focal dystonia, by the way, just shaking because you're nervous. So the way we talk to ourselves, the way we set up our minds will then result in our behaviors, which will result in the results we get. Yeah. Can you, can you talk a little bit about, um, uh, I, I love that you went into uh, neuro-linguistic programming um, and um, uh, just briefly, maybe it's too broad of a question, but I was wondering, because um, I was reading a little bit about it and it's, it's kind of similar to cognitive behavioral therapy, uh -huh. um, it, but it seems like it's more interpersonal like related. So it's like you're looking at more of the, like you were talking before, beforehand with me about how it's more um, present future based. It, um, That's right. Is that the big difference between it? There are a couple of different. So NLP stands for Neuro Linguistic Programming. So we are programming or reprogramming the computer part of the brain by language. And this starts out with a, a NLP coach. Now, part of NLP, the language part was developed by Milton Erickson, who is the father, father of modern hypnotherapy. So we are not really hypnotizing ourselves, but we are a little bit pseudo pseudo we talk to ourselves uh, with certain language patterns um, that will change the way the neural pathways in our brain operate so absolutely katie this is present to future based it is coaching it is not psychotherapy where psychotherapy if you go to see a psychiatrist for example they're medical doctors and there might be something medically challenging with the mind that might need medication or finding out something that happened uh, of a trauma or something from childhood or an just it could be anything it could be hereditary and so psychiatrists are doctors and they're fixing things that need to be fixed from something that has happened before now we're coaching um coaching is about taking where we are now what are our current challenges i get nervous for auditions I never got nervous before. I went to Carnegie Hall with Gatti and before Mahler won, I, I, I was almost freezing. I need help with my mindset here. Don't need to see a psychiatrist or a psychologist. I need mindset coaching. So then the mindset coach NLP would say, but wasn't there a time in the past where you'd go out and just be like, boom, strong-minded and full of confidence and play the best? Yes. And so what NLP does, is we, we do go visit the positives of the past and we, we replant them and then add things from what we know now as an older, more mature person to strengthen our mind to be very stoic. And we all also talk about NLPs, the mind being like a muscle and we need to exercise this. So it's not about, oh, you go have an NLP session and you do uh, timeline therapy or belief changing or the swish pattern there are a whole bunch that we can pull out of the hat with with our nlp clients and then you're yeah. done it's a bit like taking a music lesson where the teacher will say what you need to do is you need to to practice these new slur patterns or this flexibility study or this low register study and the teacher shows you how to do it plays it gives an example but then tells the student you need to do this on a regular basis, five days a week for an hour, and then you'll be able to do it. So the mind is a muscle. So what I do to my coaches, the people that I'm coaching with NLP, I give them homework where they have to do mind strengthening exercises. And I really NLP love that. is, yeah. Um, I just want to say really quickly before you move on, um, when you're talking about the, the present to future um, uh, kind of uh, involved in this. I love that because um, like we were talking beforehand, uh, Steve and I have caught up beforehand, um, you guys, but um, I, I love how you we were kind of talking about how, uh, yeah, there's kind of this thin line with musicians where um, when we go into our studies, we're kind of taught how to critically think about our playing and somewhere along that timeline, um, it goes from, you know, this enjoyment of playing, of being on stage and enjoying playing and the process involved of learning and growing to, 
oh my gosh, I really don't like this. Like I, I have this fear now of going on stage and playing and um, I don't know what's happening. And I like that it addresses that because like a lot of people, it's like um, they don't know where that derives from. They're like, where did I cross that line? When did it happen? Um, what are some common things that you you find with musicians um, who come to you for um, help uh, what are some maybe some mindsets they, they have challenges with? I know that anxiety is a really big one. Um, is there anything else you've noticed as well? Mm -hmm. Well, what I do with my clients or coaches is they are all special, amazingly talented. They're geniuses because they're professional musicians primarily. They're not all professional musicians, but most are. And a lot of time that genius and the inspiration that got them to where they are now in their position um, happened maybe when they were in their early 20s and the brain this is where medical psychology does come into place the brain works a little bit differently as it's developing for um, males i don't want to be sexist here but for males it could be a little bit of a longer timeline than than females so for males it could be until age 25 for women it could be 18 to 20, of course, this is a big generalization, but think about um, Olympic athletes and people going into the military, um, late teens, early 20s. Those of you who are listening or watching this, um, when you were winning your competitions uh, as a teenager or early 20s, maybe compared to 40s or 50s for a lot of people, it's different. So what we do is we presently dive into that genius that genius is still there because a lot of people will say i used to never get nervous but now i get nervous and as a coach i would say that part that you have and you have it you think you had it that made you not get nervous you still have it let's dig it out we might have to dig deep and when we dig deep it, this is something that we're doing in the present we are digging out that genius. It's there. And then we bring it out to the top and that stuff that's covering it, the doubt, the fear factor, the anxiety, we throw that away. We get rid of it. And also the, the, mind, the way the mind works is the mind is always full of things. And this is where things like the inner game of music and the inner game of tennis are great resources to to supplement all this NLP coaching is that rather than telling yourself not to think of something, this is all cliche, right? Don't think of the flying pink elephant and you think of it, you think of something else. So what the NLP will do is it will bring out that genius. What is the best part of you? What makes you special? And we're gonna bring that out and we're going to make it grow and by present this person is now an older wiser more experienced person will be able to control this muscle and and bring this out and uh, one more thing on nlp and why it is special is it goes beyond just the mimicking and modeling that is basically the bulk of uh the philosophies like the inner game of tennis where you copy a tennis movement and you don't think about what muscles are moving. You visualize that person. So for me as a kid, it was John McEnroe. And I was on the tennis team in high school. And I would visualize moving like John McEnroe. And it works. And that is a form of modeling. But what NLP does is it goes into all the senses. Not just what it looks like, what it feels like, what is smelled. So I just recently worked with somebody in their 60s who says, early 60s, fantastic professional musician, but says, I'm getting these little doubts and many panic attacks that I didn't get when I was younger. And so what the NLP technique will do, and what I did with this person is we bring them back to that point in time where it was really, really great. And they close their eyes and we go through a little uh, semi hypnosis, a little bit, and they relive that whole experience. And then what comes out? Certain smells. They said, yeah, I was in this room and I smelled this. And what about colors? 
yeah, I, I saw red, but it was the red of the curtains. Forget it was the curtains. You saw red. Explain the red. What about sounds? And they'll say, silence. And then we give them a little mantra or so, something for them to, to take when they get into that position later on in their 60s. They're about to feel nervous. When they have their rest and they can do their breathing and their calming and what they do, smell that smell from when they were really victorious. Just smell it. I love that. See I the colors and hear the silence. Silence is something. It's like you can have a dark room and you can turn the light on and the darkness is gone, right? There cannot be darkness if all the lights are on. And it's the same way with this, that we actually put silence in our head like it is a white light. And this is the discussion we had before, Katie, where, where people tend to be more uh, inclined to feel things, to be auditory, digital, have to figure out things, see things, hear things. So each coach here, each person is individual. This is where the coach will identify what is the um, you know, primary senses and, and how they're experiencing things. Yeah. And then that's how we use the, the coaching process. That's really wonderful. I, thank you so much for explaining that um, in full detail. And I, I love that you um, brought up the senses. Um, that made me really think about, um, it just brought me back. I had to quickly say, um, I, I, I read a lot of uh, sports uh, medicine articles and people have forwarded them to me and stuff, but um, by Gabriel Wolf, who um, has studied like tennis um, uh, and sports psychology. And I think it's really interesting because she's done a lot of research on on attentional focus, like where mm -hmm. do you, um, athletes focus their attention, like a lot of time the coaches will focus on like body movement, like, uh, you know, twist your wrist this way or like, you know, very specific body mechanics. And um, when we think about that applied to musicians, it's like, wow, we really do kind of the similar thing where we get so focused on either like specific technique, or, uh, you know, can even be like, you know, the uh, tonguing, specific tonguing, or, you know, uh, or slurs or whatever we're focused on. Um, and so many times we forget to um, uh, remember that, you know, playing music and performing music, it's not just only a process, but it's, it's this in the moment thing, we have to be present and fully present when we're playing. Um, and I like that you brought up the senses, everything, because I think we forget about that. And when I think about my youth, like when I played music, and I enjoyed playing in front of others, like, how much I wasn't lost in this whole I have to do this correctly or else like type of mindset. Mm -hmm. um, and it was much more about the full um, kinesthetic, well, not kinesthetic, but the whole experience with the senses and everything. Um, and I love that, that that's what you do. Um, do you find that certain things? Um, um, well, yeah, you said it was very individual, but um, maybe can you explain uh, what are some of the things that um, musicians kind of their mindsets go to when they're performing, they're dealing with anxiety. I know a lot of it has to deal with failure or perfectionism. Mm -hmm. I like those two words. So this is a, a good starting point. Um, there's no failure. It doesn't exist. Reframe that. It's feedback. And there's no such thing as perfection either. There, there might be for a short amount of time for a specific thing, like if you're in the military and have to have perfectly shined shoes. All right, maybe, but to play the Mahler one solo on double bass perfectly, perfection is a perception. So there will be listeners who will hear their favorite double bass player and they'll go, that's perfect. Maybe the conductor goes, no, that's not perfect. I don't like it that way of the highest level. And so here's where people get a lot of stress and anxiety at auditions or competitions, or if they're in the hot seat and they're, it's live stream, the camera's on their face. And everybody, they feel everyone's leaning in. And if they're, if they're telling themselves they want to play this perfectly, this is going to be impossible because perfection is a perception. Here's an example. I'm on the panel for my orchestra and we have a position for, let's pick an instrument, viola, okay? And I'm not a viola player, I'm a tuba player. And guess what? If you're a tuba player, a trombone player, you will have a viola player on your panel. So this is how it goes. 
candidate A, B, and C are in the finals. And I like A. As a matter of fact, for my perception, A was perfect. Nothing to say. Great, let's hire this person. Then the person next to me says, you like that one? Sounded a bit scratchy in the lower register and you know, the slurs were, were stuffy. And then someone else in the panel says, they didn't do this and this and this. And the conductor says, I don't like any of them. So what the candidates need to do, this goes for anybody taking an audition, don't tell yourself you need to be perfect because there will not be a panel that's going to unanimously experience you as perfect. What you need to do is you need to be the best version of yourself, the best version of yourself. All right, I've got an audition for the Seattle Symphony or the Sid Sydney Symphony in two months. I'm going to be the best version of myself and every day I'm going to get better. And then through this sort of NLP coaching or inner game of music, however you want to be, you visualize what that audition is going to sound like. And with NLP, with my people that I coach in the headspace for auditions, what are you going to feel like? What are you going to smell? Maybe. What are you going to hear in your head? You know, are you going to feel weighted in your chair with feathery hands as a string player? Whatever works. Or a light right elbow and a strong whatever it is for every person is different. You need to engage the mind so you can program how your mind is going to experience and feel when you do this audition. And the result will be you will play the best of your ability. You will present the best version of yourself. So the goal should be when that audition is, is that that was the best I could have played. That was the best version of myself. Now it's up to the panel members to experience and perceive and judge you. Judging is not your job. Of course, you'll do your homework. What are they looking for? And you'll try to present that. But then there's the next part is we have no control over what another person thinks. We think we, we think we do. And a lot of self-proclaimed gurus on YouTube will tell you that you can control how another person thinks. But the reality is, if I'm going to be a guest in an orchestra and I go play in that orchestra, I cannot control what the concert master is going to think of my playing. The conductor is going to think of my playing. All I can do is my best. And then, of course, we have our discussions. They don't like this. They like this. We can change. So to get rid of performance anxiety, there's no failure. You get feedback. There's no perfection. You just play to the best version of yourself and grow and learn every day. I agree. And I, lo I love that you said that. Um, and I think also, um, would you say also part of it? Well, this is kind of a weird um, thing that just popped up in my head, but I feel like um, sometimes a lot of musicians, especially when we're younger, we kind of idolize like the professional level players. Mm -hmm. And then we don't really hear the stories of how they've kind of struggled to get there. Instead, we kind of hear the story of like, well, they did this and this and this and this and this, and then they got there and it was like, you know done they were they're sealed and done and it was perfect and and um we keep asking ourselves well if i'm not there by this age or if i'm not there you know right now um what does that say about my playing so a lot of times we we like to we rely too much on others to tell us if we're good enough or if we're qualified enough to be a pro labeled as a professional level player i think a lot of that ties into it in the sense that we don't really speak up about the challenges that we face and that's why one of the reasons i do this because i love that we're talking about mindset one of the big things is mindset um would you say that also that plays kind of a factor as well absolutely and this sounds like the piece on i'm really worried about what other people think of me mm -hmm. Yeah, I think and so too. Our, our brains can only fill in, fill up our head. There can only be so much in there. So we have a choice. This is mindset. We have a choice. What are we going to fill that head with? Imagine a cup or a vase. What are you going to put in that? Don't let other people put in whatever they want to put in there. You put in what you want to put in. So rather than me worrying about what other people think, 
what I would do and what I would suggest people to do is like, let's say John is my coachee and John says, I'm really, I'm really stressed out and struggling because I, I'm worried because people think this of me and people think that of me and people think this of me and people think that of me. What I would say to him, I would say, all right, let's just erase that slate. What kind of person do you want to be? What kind of person do you want to project to the world? Oh, I want to have integrity. I want to be a hard worker. I want to be honest. I want to be, you know, healthy and blah, blah, blah. And what kind of people do you want to surround yourself with? And then they will just usually mention those same characteristics. So then the answer is stop worrying about what other people think of you and use that energy to become the person and project yourself to the world, the person that you want to be. And you work at it every day. And then we make lists and they start doing it. And guess what happens later on, those same like-minded people come to them. And here's the saying that we see in the coaching world, your vibe attracts your tribe. So then you will be surrounded by people who think you're awesome. <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Thank you for saying all that. And I think it's so <laughs> true. I think it's so true because, um, you know, worst uh, and maybe this is a thing that has to deal with your, um, maybe it ties into, I, you've been doing a couple of a, a series on introversion, on people who are introverted yes. and how to be a creative type that's introverted. And I love that because I feel like even though I'm, sometimes my friends say, oh, I'm an extrovert. I'm more of like an ambivert. I kind of go in between, but um, I feel like when I, uh, I have kind of grown up and I've, I've always kind of been this uh, quieter type when I was younger. And I feel like a lot of times um, I didn't really know what my values and principles were um, because I'm so used to being from a young age, I started as a musician being told like what was right or what was wrong. And not only that, but even including like just parental advice. And mm -hmm. so I think going along the way, when I look at it, I'm like, wow, as I got older, I finally was able to define my values and principles. Um, that's helped so much to define your individuality. I think that's so important in music because sometimes you don't think of it that way. How can I be individual and unique and, and not just focus on, oh, how can I be better than the rest? Instead, focusing on how can I be the best version of myself of who I am? What makes me who I am? What are my values and principles? And what can I bring to the table as a person rather than just a musician and carry that through in my playing? And I think that's really beautiful that you said that, because I totally believe that, that your vibe attracts your tribe. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, there's another terminology to it. I think it's the law of attraction. <laughs> yes. Mm -hmm. um, and then some, you know, you'll, you'll, and I've read the book and I think it's great and there's some truth in it. And then you have the other side. Uh, there is no law of attraction. This is the truth about it. But, you know, each individual needs to reframe this and experience whatever this phenomenon is. And I like the vibe, your vibe will attract your tribe because, you know, we have these other terms such as birds of a feather flock together. Yeah, um, and the same in, in neurology, neurons that fire together, wire together. <laughs> that's right. That's right. So if let's, let's say you're a person who wants to be like that group of people, then you need to start hanging out with that group of people because there's that other saying that you're an average of the five people that you hang out with the most. So if you're happy with that, wonderful. But if you're not, then you can sort of quietly within yourself, reach out of your comfort zone and start projecting the kind of person you want to be and then gravitate to those kind of people. But at first they might, you know, let's just say here's an example. Somebody wants to hang out with rich people. And but I'm a tuba player <laughs> and I hang out with the rich people and I say, Oh, what do you play? Oh, you do that for a living. Oh, and you get this. Oh, you, you, do, you get paid for that. Oh, and how much? And you tell them, they go, Oh, and then they, they go off and talk with their rich people that make millions of dollars every month and their passive income. And I'm going like, well, maybe I don't want to be rich, but then this is a bit starting going off topic, but it's an example of then you decide what kind of person do you really, really want to be? What kind of a musician do you want to be? And what, you know, what, what my great teachers always told me, they said, play with people who are better than you. 
Surround yourselves with people who are better than you as a growing musician as a, when I was a young man. And that's, that's the best thing you can do is, wow. And then when I got into the Sydney Symphony Orchestra, you know, I was able to play with Boston, Philadelphia, San Francisco, six months with Concertgebouw, and always being challenged with these high-end musicians um, where you do step out of your comfort zone a little bit, walking into the Concertgebouw as a 50-year-old after being in the Sydney Symphony for 27, 28 years, they go, who's this guy from Sydney? Why is he here for six months? And then my mindset, I, I cannot control how these people think. I cannot control how they respond to me. What I can control is the person I wanna be and the player I wanna be, and it worked out fine. It worked out great. <laughs> Oh, I'm so glad to hear but that. But it was challenging here. It's challenging here. It, it, I, and I had just have to say, yeah, you know, uh, often when I think in orchestra, I'm like, wow, you know, like I, I, I think of the the principal tuba player and then the principal piccolo player. And you both are like the well, the extreme ends of the orchestra, like holding <laughs> us all in place. And I think that it takes so much strength and so much inner um just, um, you know, a healthy mindset to be able to play those roles because you're like the only one, the only one that's hired, the only one that's sitting there every concert after every concert. There's not like, you know, like four of you or five of you. <laughs> We're not allowed to get sick. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> you're not allowed to have a cold or cough or just call nope. sick. Yeah. <laughs> That's really amazing. I, I love that. Um, I just want to say thank you again for being here because I really value this conversation. And um, I think that uh, speaking about this is really important. Um, before we uh, got on here, I just want to mention that uh, Steve and I were talking. One of the reasons I like doing this uh, live stream is because um, musicians are able to see the faces of practitioners that help musicians and makes them more approachable and I think that just uh, helps others out as well so um, again if you're interested in Steve's uh, information I'll go ahead and link it in the bio section in the comment section um, at some point after our live stream is done I'm um, Steve I'm gonna go off camera and cough for a second I'm sorry uh, while she's coughing if anybody wants to reach out to me the email address is quite easy to remember tuba coach doesn't mean I coach tuba. I do coach tuba. Life coaching, professional coaching, mindset coaching, NLP coaching, tuba coaching. The email address is tubacoach at gmail.com. And my coaching website is steverossay.com.au. There are quite a few uh, mindset resources there for you. Um, and feel free to reach out anytime as a friend you there katie i am i'm so sorry you guys um, <laughs> that's all right i just got sick like two days ago and i'm like really really why <laughs> yeah i'm I, I have to cough a lot but um can we uh go ahead and we're actually going to talk a little bit about how this applies to dystonia sorry mm -hmm. yeah i could i can cover for you while you clear your throat <laughs> because because we had the conversation already katie uh first of all thank you katie for all the awareness you've been uh, providing for us. I see there are more than a thousand people on in these Facebook groups and things like that. Um, my experience with focal dystonia was first uh, as a young man with when, when a few of the people I really, really respect and admire and, and look up to and learn from were my teachers, um, unfortunately went through focal dystonia and, and left their positions uh, you know, maybe 10 to 15 years before what would be considered uh, retirement age. And as a young man there, I thought, wow, I need to learn about this for two reasons. One is for myself, if this happens, and for my colleagues, my students as well. So I have been on sort of a mission uh, to educate myself on what this is all about and how I can help people. Now, I am working as a mindset coach for a few focal dystonia people going through rehab, and we are fully confident that they will be able to return back to work better than ever in a, in a new form. But um, Katie and I had a discussion on basically three stages. These are, of course, generalizations, and everybody's unique and individual, but there are three general stages, aren't there, Katie, when, uh, when we go through this? That, that the mindset would need help with? 
Yeah, I definitely agree. Um, and like you were bringing them up as well. And um, I also mentioned like the kind of the layers of, of the things that we have to go through, the different type of reactions we have to our plane as well as the grieving process. But I love how you explain them. Um, so if you could explain a little bit how you see that as well, um, I feel like you're better able to express it than I am. <laughs> well, that's all right. Well, I've been I've been working with this because um, uh, you know there there are quite a few wonderful focal dystonia uh, rehab physio doctors um, out there in the United States and and across the world, and I want to thank all of you for what you're doing for our people. Um, one of our uh, physiotherapists for the Sydney Symphony Orchestra for several years has gone off to Germany and studied. Uh, physiotherapy for focal dystonia rehab and works with some very important people and as far as i'm hearing it's all being successful so far and i provide the mental mindset scaffolding around what she does her name is bronwyn ackerman by the way she's australian based in germany um, there is an organization that she and frankie losordo run called brass rehab so everybody can check that out if you're not familiar with them. Um, but the first stage of the people that I've worked with is fear and sadness, denial, anger. Um, people who were working professionally in their teens and are faced with a situation in their 30s, 40s, 50s, wherever that if they can't do this, what can they do? And they actually believe they can do nothing else in their life. So this is an incredible amount of stress on the mind, the heart and the soul. Now, the physiotherapist can say, okay, you've got to get off the instrument, you've got to do you know, exercises and blow on a marshmallow or whatever is done, you know, ears, whatever, breathing, whatever. But the mind at this point is going to go through a similar sequence is what people go through with grief when a loved one passes away, for example. It'll be the same thing, all the things that I just mentioned. So what we do with the mindset coaching is we say, okay, this is present to future based. This is an opportunity, A, for you to reach out to people that you didn't know exist in your life. You've got people like Katie and her organization. Uh, you've got Steve, you've got psychologists, you've got probably everybody who works for an orchestra or professional band or as a member of a union, will be able to go to somebody, at least in private, and get free counseling services, psychologists, whatever. So number one stage, accept the fact that help is out there. And number two, human beings were not designed to do life alone, especially emotionally and mentally. Now, as brass players, I know in my generation, we're stoic. Ego, maybe, yeah. I don't want to admit that I have a problem. I don't want anybody to know that. Oh my gosh. Well, guess what? Let's, let's realize this is 2021. We are all vulnerable. We are all human beings. We are all organic. We're all in flow. This, no matter our age, will someday stop for all of us. Now, we don't want it to stop prematurely. So stage one, acceptance. Yep. I've got this condition and it's no fault of my own. Anybody who has focal dystonia, it's no fault of your own. No fault of your own. Help is there. Okay. So once it's acknowledged that there's help and you've got a physiotherapist and you've got a plan and you think, hey, this is a chance in my life now to learn uh, maybe to do some other things because you're not going to be practicing eight hours a day like you used to when you're going to focal dystonia rehab. So for example, one of uh, people I'm working with uh, loves cooking for their family. And now there's this joy that this person was unable to do much of, can do a lot, and is going through the happiest months of this person's life. And just because you play an instrument really well and you're a genius of that instrument does not mean you're limited to being a genius of only that thing. This is the time to find out like, I'm a wonderful cook or I'm a wonderful kayaker or I'm a wonderful partner person to this or I'm a wonderful person who shelters dogs, whatever it happens to be, this is stage one. And then learning to trust the rehab process and to stay in the moment day by day. Don't worry about the future. Trust, 
So this whole mindset restructure is stage one. Stage two will be, let's say it's a six month rehab progress uh, process, excuse me. Of course, sometimes they're gonna be longer, sometimes shorter, but let's say six months. When, when the person is going through this, yeah, then they start buzzing again, they start playing again, they can look at their instrument and they can play and you think, wow. And then their, their doctor says, their rehab, local dystonia rehab person says, I think you're gonna be ready to go back to work in two months. And they go, oh, and they go home, they're thinking like in two months and they start visualizing going into their orchestra or their band or wherever they work. And they start thinking about what other people think. So where's so-and-so? Oh, he has this thing called focal, re, uh, focal dystonia. So medical leave for six, nine months, whatever. Oh, okay. Ooh, gee, I wonder what that is. Oh, gee, well, let's not talk about that too much. No, no, let's change the subject, yeah. <laughs> another thing we've got to change, but that's, that's, that's for another session. So, but this person who's going to come back is going to be thinking about that, think about the colleagues. And maybe there's silence and nobody's really in the workplace is not really reaching out. So this is where the next stage of mindset fortification comes in. They're going to start visualizing when they come back to work. So we start, I start doing some NLP techniques to have them rehearse and program their mind. They're worried a little bit. Is this really going to work? Yeah, I know it's going to work, but is it going to work? So the mindset in stage two is not worrying about whether it's going to work or not, but what is your mind going to be doing when you go back? You set up the mind right, then it's going to work. And if it doesn't work, there's a little bit of feedback and, and you keep going and you take a little bit longer. That's fine. So that's stage two, yeah. being able to not walk around and worry about this all the time. And stage three is when you actually go back to work. And get a phone call, Steve, uh, quickly on the phone or, or, or by, by this, I'm going on stage in 20 minutes. Can we do a swish NLP swish pattern for five minutes? Yep. Let's do swish. We do swish. Boom. They go out. Boom. Mind. So those are the three stages, um, that I've experienced. Yeah. And I completely agree. And it's, um, it's really difficult. Um, I know, and just giving a little bit of my, my experience here as example, uh, when I went back on stage um, for the first time, it was really scary. Um, <laughs> it was so interesting because um, the same thing happened to me, which I hear from a lot of other musicians that try and do this, is um, we recover a lot and then we try to go back on stage and we have this kind of mindset of like, okay, um, it's all this recovery that I've done, it's going it, to it's, it's go perfectly. <laughs> And then we get out there and it's like, we almost resort back to like, we're like, oh my gosh, we over-exaggerate. Our mind over-exaggerates all the time. It's like, oh, that was like, I might as well have been at like stage one focal dystonia. Like I was having tremors. It was awful. Like everything's going wrong and that kind of thing. Um, and e even though I didn't have any type of coaching, but I, I, I really am into mindset or mindfulness, sorry, mindfulness. And so I was like, I really need to center myself and like, uh, you know, get back into this um, into less in this whole freaking out moment into uh, more calmness state, like calming my nervous system. So I did a lot of like visual techniques, a lot of like breathing, a lot of calming myself, my nervous system, like prepping myself and uh, just reminding myself to enjoy this moment, to really celebrate this moment of being on stage again and being like, oh, wow, you know, I, I'm finally here. I don't care how bad I sound. I don't care like if there's mistakes, I don't care about that. I'm just here to enjoy playing again and being around others so focusing on other things sometimes helps a lot too like focusing on like well I just enjoy making friends I'm just here to make friends <laughs> <laughs> to be a part of the community again rather than focusing on wow I'm trying to you know you know boost back my reputation as a musician um I think there's a, a clear line between that because it's like wow uh reminding yourself of again what your values and principles are I really value community I really value collaborating with people I really value that connection that's what I value most uh as a musician so focusing on that rather than um you know how are people going to view me as I play what are they going to hear that kind of thing yeah I I love that Katie and you you figured it out for yourself you're going to focus on these things rather than what other people are thinking of you. 
Yeah, exactly. And it, it takes Beautiful. a lot of a lot of work because, you know, like you said, you were talking about how some people are more visual, some mm -hmm. more are like in their senses, like the smelling, the seeing, mm -hmm. uh, the hearing, that kind of thing. And I think finding out which one's your weakness, like, okay, like, for example, mine is hearing. It's like, once I hear a bad note come out, it's like, oh, Lord, no. Um, <laughs> and trying a way to distract yourself from that and not distract it, but like, you know, focusing on what's more important at the moment. Um, Cause it's not the end all be all. Sounding bad is not the end all be all, believe it or not. <laughs> but um, I, I mean, I guess the doubt, the only thing is like, I'm not a professional level musician. So, um, you know, I don't know how, um, you know, being a professional level type of environment would feel with this type of um, disorder. But I know that uh, people do it. Uh, for example, Alex Klein, who I've interviewed, he's he's tremendously, he's still a legendary oboe player and just amazing. <laughs> yeah, he's great. Wonderful. He's so legendary. And yet he's so still hard on himself, you know, with his vocal dystonia, but he still finds a way to manage it. And he comes out really strong. And it has a lot to deal with his mindset and his strength and his courage and his passion. <laughs> that's, that's, that's absolutely wonderful. Yeah, it's, it's mindset, isn't it? Because we are experiencing what we're doing by how we're thinking about it, isn't it? I mean, yeah. you, can, you can send two children to Disneyland, they'll probably have a great time, right? But you can send adults to Disneyland, and one will be going like, oh, I love it, this is great. And the other one's going to be like, going, lying, <laughs> blah, 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 blah. But it's the same, it's the same uh, external factors coming into our senses. And I think it's the same as musicians. And this is why I'm loving this interview and getting to know you, Katie, because you're talking about collaborating with people, making music. And if you're playing, say, a Mahler symphony or a Tchaikovsky, Shostakovich Overture, you're playing this person's music, Dvorak New World Symphony. You are playing Dvorak. Dvorak created some art. And you are their paintbrush. Isn't this a gift? And the people in the audience are most likely not professional musicians. And a lot of them are not even there to hear the orchestra, sorry, or whoever you are the, with a big name tuba guy or a girl. They're here to hear, they're, they're going to hear Dvorak. Oh, the symphony's playing Mozart, I'm going. <laughs> They'll hear anybody play Mozart. And so we as musicians were thinking, oh gee, I, you know, I, I hope I don't, I have this note coming up that I, sometimes struggle with i'm i hope i don't miss it because of what people will think they're just there to hear the music and they want the music to be great they are at you know people in the audience are at the back you know, on your back you know not on your back but they've got your back they want you to play well and even those scary conductors guess what they might seem like they're waiting for you to mess up but they also want you to play well and so this goes back to sort of something that I would like to be a takeaway for everybody. If you're doing an audition, a performance, or recovering from an injury, remember that everybody who's listening, probably every single one of them, wants you to do your best. Nobody is going to go get up at 8 o'clock on a Saturday morning when they can be taking their kids to soccer to hear, and say they're an oboe player, to hear a tuba audition. <laughs> Maybe they want to, but what they want is they want to get a great tuba player or cello or harp or violin or oboe. They want everybody to play their best. And so when you go on stage and take your audition, remember, everybody on the panel, even if they're looking at you like this, they probably just don't want to be there because it's an audition. Don't take it personally. But they want somebody to win that job. And you tell yourself, they all want me. So I'm going to show them what I do best. Same as when you're performing something difficult and you're feeling nervous. Most importantly, if you're recovering from focal dystonia or any other injury, when you come back, everybody wants you to, to not only play as well as you've played before, but play even better because you've learned so much on your journey. Everybody is supporting you. So I think the way the mind works is we think, gee, I'm wondering what everyone's going to think of me. You know what everyone's thinking? 
they want you to win this. They want you to succeed. They want you to not only play the best you can, but they want you to experience it with great fulfillment and joy. And like Katie said, collaborate, playing together. It's beautiful. Yeah, I totally agree with that. And I love that. I love that. And I think that, um, you know, being a musician is such an honor, even whether we're injured or not, um, we're still musicians. And um, I think that uh, this has been such a wonderful discussion because um, we don't often get to talk about the challenges that we face as musicians, especially on the inside, like mentally, uh, mm -hmm. psychologically, um, physically. But um, I really do uh, like that you brought this up. And especially with those who have focal dystonia, um, it's such a multi-layered process that we have to work through to different reactions, through the grieving process, through the loss of reputation, through learning how to embrace our sound, love our sound. And then once we get back into play and again with others, learning how to focus on other things besides the little ebb and flow of setbacks that we deal with along the way. Um, Cause like you were mentioning before, a lot of us want to have a very linear style of pro progress, um, especially when we're injured. And oftentimes it's not linear, it's very <laughs> all over the place. It's not, not a pretty process, but uh, learning to embrace it and find the beauty in it is so important. And um, I just really love that you brought all of this up. And, and I, I hope that we can have more discussions over this because I know there's different areas we can talk about. Oh, absolutely. Um, I'm looking forward. Um, before we go, um, yeah, I was thinking maybe we could do even a session over like just, you know, basic general, general, uh, what is it called? Like general distortions, cognitive distortions that people deal uh -huh. with, like the whole, like you were saying, some people, if they're in traffic, they're focused on like how bad traffic is versus like, I'm enjoying this time, like sitting next to the person in the car with me and talking to them. Um, like that kind of like this cognitive distortion that creeps in and wreaks havoc on our self-esteem. That would be a wonderful topic. I would love to have one on that. Yeah. And then maybe also like uh, to do, deal with the, the sides of like uh, how perfectionism and um, procrastination play hand in hand, because mm -hmm. not a lot of people know that procrastination is basically, basically perfectionism. <laughs> the same side of the, same, the, same. Side of the same coin. Yeah. <laughs> Um, and for those of you viewing this live or the recording, you can go to my website and download a free PDF on perfection and procrastination, um, www.steverossa.com.au. Um, so the way the perfection procrastination works, especially as musicians, um, sometimes we will hesitate to make that recording or put that thing on YouTube or make that CD or even take an audition because we want it to be perfect. Um, let's say I have a pile of papers there on the side in the corner and I look at that, I gotta start chipping away at that. It never starts because part of me, and I don't even realize this, it wants it to be perfect. I want it to do all of them. I can just do one inch or one paper a day and after, one week or one month, it'll all be gone. So that's a little bit of an analogy um, that we use in coaching because we'll get, this is in the life coaching, we'll get clients who say, yeah, I need, this is, we get some of these things with life coaching, it's wonderful. Yeah, I, I'm on the session today, I wanna to talk about, you know, just keeping my car clean. Because when my car is cluttered, it's like a cluttered mind, it makes me angry in traffic. And I say, okay, well, here's your homework assignment. Today, you're going to take one thing out of your car that doesn't need to be there and either throw it in the trash, recycle it, or put it away. Just one thing. Ah. And the reason why that person can't start is because they're visualizing the perfectly clean car. So the subconscious expectation of perfection is creating the procrastination. That's why they haven't started cleaning their car. So the same can uh, apply to anything with with music as well or anything that you might next time anybody who's um watching viewing this uh is about to procrastinate something ask yourself is it because i need to be perfect you don't need to be perfect just one one thing if it's a pile of dishes in the sink just just put away just wash one start there it's not perfect and then you know what's going to happen <laughs> you're going to wash all of them <laughs> that's a life coaching tip for today <laughs> <laughs> Oh, thank you, Steve, so much. I love this conversation. And I think that's really wonderful advice that you gave there. And um, I hope for those who are viewing, um, you can always send in your questions to me again. Um, we had a hello from um, Pat 
Pat Lugo. Pat Lugo. Yes, I know Pat. Yeah, Pat's saying hello. We have a bunch of viewers on here. Um, Julie, hi, Julie Maximus. Uh, she said wonderful concepts here. Thank you, Julie, so much for joining us. I always love seeing your comments in the comment section. Um, and then I just want to quickly say that um, thank you guys for watching. And um, what I'm going to do now is once we leave this uh, live stream, it will be on Facebook. So you can share it with other people if you want to. Mm -hmm. um, I'm also going to edit it and post on YouTube and it will be mm -hmm. up on my channel as well. And and it'll be nice and pretty, nice, pretty intro and ending on there as well. Um, and then Steve, I just really value this conversation. I really hope I get to interview again. Um, and I would love to go into just various topics because I feel like I could sit here and speak for hours with you. But um, uh, let's do <laughs> Yeah, I'd love to. And then for those who are still watching us, I just want to quickly say um, I spoke with Steve a little bit about this before. I'm going to put it more out there. But right now I'm kind of in the middle of a concept of building an organization that's um, a model of organized, pro basically a prototype organization that centers on musician health and well-being. So if you have any ideas or input you want to put in, in the comments of like what type of programs I can involve, I know this is not really related, uh, just let me know um, because um, it is going to center around uh, mind mindset and mindfulness as well. So mm -hmm. all right. Well, Steve, thank you so much. Um, I'll put your information in the description section and comments for everyone. And um, is there any last parting words you'd like to say? Um, well, well, people out there might not be aware of my mindset for creative community that everybody is welcome to join. It's free. Basically, what you get is you get uh, something from me through your email on videos, tips, podcast links, whatever everything mindset for anybody who might be creatively minded so if you want to get onto that um i could put that in the chat box um katie yeah should i do that here um yeah but feel, feel free to to reach out there and here we go it is right here um okay, let's see here we go Mm -hmm. yeah so i will share that as well and then um if anyone has more questions just remember to send them to my inbox um you can always do it on my personal facebook account too um as you feel comfortable and then anyone else has forwarded me questions so please know that it just takes me a couple days to get them ready and then send them over to steve so all right all right well, I'll put this, i'm putting this in the chat box now so it's just a little url um there it is you see that it says mailchimp Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, so if, any, okay. if anybody's interested in that, otherwise you can just go to the website, my coaching website, steverossay.com.au, and then you can click on there, and then you're part of this community where you get all my, all the free stuff that I send out, and if anybody's interested in thinking like, gee, I wonder if some one-on-one -on -one coaching would be for me, maybe it is, maybe it isn't, but I do offer free 20-minute consultations by Zoom, or we can have a chat, see if it's for you, see if it's not. And and if it's, you know, however way we go, I'll try to make sure that you have some good takeaways from that. So please reach out to the coach at gmail.com. All right. Well, thank you, Steve, so much for joining me today. Um, we're going to go ahead and log off here. And then um, I will message you just to say that um, I'll send you a link to the live stream. Um, otherwise, thank you so much for joining me. And I hope you have a lovely day over in Australia. And thank you for being up so early with me. <laughs> thank you, Katie. And thank you to all of you who have joined us live from across the world. It's, uh, it's, it's been a pleasure being with you all. And thank you for those of you viewing this later on in YouTube. You can still reach out to me and Katie the same way. And thank you, Katie. I look forward to having another conversation with you very, very soon. All right. Thank you, Steve, so much. Thanks, Katie. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye, -bye.